Um, I hope you're all back. Hope you've gotten some sunshine if you're from Africa. Uh, from the rest of the world, I don't know what you got, <laughs> but uh, we have some sunshine here right now and we are very glad to have you back um, in this second part of uh, today's seminar. Um, and today the theme, a renaissance of the African Christian mind. And that's what we are putting our thinking around. Um, how do we renew? What is, how do we renew the African Christian mind? And it is my greatest privilege to welcome uh, our dear brother in the Lord, um, Vishal Mangalwadi, to take us through the first part of this session. Um, and I must say that when I read Vishal's book, Truth and Transformation, which perhaps many of you have read, this was the turning point for me. Um, when I realized that there is more to Christianity, there is more to the work that we are doing than just uh, saving souls to go to heaven. There is a real change that the scriptures can bring when they are applied into our everyday life. And that is what um, this education revolution is about. And uh, as we have heard, there's a book now around this revolution, the third education revolution, which you can get on Google, um, sorry, not on Google, on Amazon. And it, it builds on this vision and it uh, crystallizes it and answers a lot of the questions we may have about how really would it be possible that education can bring a transformation of societies. And indeed, can Africa become the light of the world through education? So um, without much ado, let me welcome uh, Vishal Magarwadi to take us through this next few minutes uh, as we think around um, the topic of, um, sorry, our topic that he'll be handling today is the Scholars Forum and the Africa Education Revolution. Welcome very much, Vishal Magalwadi. Th thank you, Liz. Uh, you didn't introduce yourself. Uh, may I request you to take a minute to introduce Veritas Africa Education and yourself? I see your <laughs> good husband is also online. Yes, he is. Uh, hi, Patrice. We're not in the same house right now or same room. Uh, thank you very much, um, Vishal. Yes, um, you know, Veritas Education Africa was actually born out of this Truth and Transformation book that I read because I have been involved heavily with the homeschool movement in Kenya for many years, having homeschooled our children for 20 years. And um, I always wondered, isn't there more? We are so glad to have given a biblical education an education founded on biblical principles for our children, but how many Kenyan families can afford to do that? How many Kenyan families can take their children out of school and educate them privately or access the expensive private Christian schools that we know of? And I always wondered, isn't there more? How can we um, push this further? How can we indeed make God's word a light for all children regardless of whether they have money or not, whether they can afford to live on one income or not. And so this began answering the questions for me. And therefore we founded Veritas Education Africa, which is about reestablishing the biblical foundations of education. So bringing together networks of educators, training teachers, training homeschool parents on how to give an education to children that will equip them to think and reason with biblical principles. So I am an educator. I have a degree in um, education and a master's degree in education psychology. But I have found that as, as Gillian was saying, you know, a lot of um, the education really we get is founded on humanistic philosophies. And my journey in education and even now with the education revolution movement has helped um, define what is Christian education? What is a Christian philosophy of education? What methods can we use to educate our children in truth? So I'm very privileged to be a part of this. And I welcome all of us who are here. As we have said, there is room for everyone. The work is plenty. Uh, through Veritas Education Africa, we are uh, coordinating the work of the revolution in Kenya, but we need everybody on board. And uh, it is our great privilege to welcome everyone and bring in all the skills and talents that we see represented even in this meeting. Thank you very much, uh, Vishal. And my husband, Patrice, is here. And uh, thank you also for being here, Patrice. 
Um, Karibu Vishal, welcome. Thank you again. So our topic for this session is Africa Scholars Forum and the Third Education Revolution. We had hoped that Dr. Ashish Alexander will speak to us on encyclopedia. Um, so we've talked about elementary school, primary school, high school, college education, uh, but one of the outcomes of these two days of summit uh, should be that every one of you uh, chooses one topic to write an article for a future encyclopedia, uh, which at the moment we are calling collegepedia. It may be a hundred word article, it may be 10,000 word article, uh, but between now and August, when we meet face to face, uh, we want every scholar who is here to choose one article. You know, it may be as simple a thing as how to cook banana most in a most nutritious way. If that's what you can write about for an encyclopedia, please do. Uh, get two or three people to critique what you have written uh, so that both in terms of content, if you're writing a serious uh, article on uh, history of your country, Idi Amin in Uganda. Uh, you want historians, military people, politicians to review what you have written. And then you want some editors who are, you may be a good researcher, but to make your writing both easy to read and engaging, you might want to work with a editor so part of this exercise of you working with other researchers, you might want to take up a scientific subject. Um, you might take up a historical subject like Frank mentioned the pyramids which were there in countries other than Egypt. Uh, if you want to take up any of those subjects to write an encyclopedia entry you want it to be reviewed and critiqued by other experts and then also uh, improved, edited by people who are gifted in uh, writing style. Now, why is this important? Uh, because most people do not know that encyclopedia is a Christian idea, Protestant idea specifically. It, the idea began with uh, Francis Bacon who is called the father of modern education. It received a more complete, a cohesive a vision why encyclopedia is needed by the father of modern education, which is John Amos Comenius. John Amos Comenius was the one who uh, proposed uh, that we need to create Pansophia, a system of knowledge which is comprehensive, which is, uh, sees the universe as universe, not multiverse, where all knowledge and information comes together uh, around truth, around holiness, character, etc. Now, Comenius was writing his, he wrote 90 books, 40 of them on education, during Europe's 30 year war. And he, uh, the uh, Protestants, Catholics fighting with each other, uh, they didn't have the time and the capacity to take up Comenius's proposal uh, to build encyclopedia. Therefore, after the French Revolution, French Enlightenment was the first one that, uh, there had been other attempts, but the French Enlightenment uh, with Diderot, et cetera, took uh, the leadership of encyclopedia movement. So ever since the French Encyclopedia came, the Br Encyclopedia Britannica came, and other encyclopedias came, uh, they were fundamentally anti-Christian, but they didn't even have uh, a, any metaphysical or philosophical or worldview basis for believing that all truth is one truth. It should fit together. It should be cohesive. 
So when Wikipedia began, uh, Wikipedia believed in neutrality. It was very clear that we are not here to seek truth. Wikipedia doesn't exist to seek truth or seek morality or cultivate morality. They adopted as its policy neutrality, that if there are six different conflicting opinions on a particular subject, we will permit all six of them to express themselves without taking a line, without favoring one or the other issue. So uh, Wikipedia began with the commitment to neutrality, an explicit commitment that we are not seeking truth. Uh, but so here you have a whole quest for knowledge, which from the outset is saying that we don't know the truth. We're not interested in seeking truth or promoting something as truth, uh, but we're going to be neutral. But two years ago, they gave up neutrality in practice. And the last few six months or so ago, they gave up a neutrality explicitly. So today, if you believe that marriage means one man, one woman, uh, exclusive and lifelong relationship, you are disqualified automatically from being an editor of encyclopedia, of Wikipedia. What that means is that a six-year-old kid, he is not just a uh, I mean, sixth grade student, he or she is not just reading textbooks and listening to uh, classes when a teacher gives a project to a sixth grade, seventh grade student, uh, he or she is actually consulting Wikipedia. A uh, source of knowledge which is explicitly anti-Christian. I do not know about how they're describing Christianity in Africa, but in India, the great people who came inspired by the Bible and built uh, modern India, like William Carey is the father of modern India. Alexander Duff really is the father of in modern Indian education, though the prophet of uh, in, uh, education in India was Charles Grant, who published his book in 1792. But Alexander Duff was the one who built, uh, who inspired the great colleges in Calcutta, Madras, Mumbai, and in other places, Bombay, Wilson College, uh, so the, through the Scottish church, his leadership in Scottish Presbyterian movement uh, was at the root. But if you read the Wikipedia article on him, they condemn him, the man who educated India, as he was a terrible man because he was out to convert people. So it's fine for people to be worshiping demons and snakes and cows and uh, stones and wood, but someone who is inspiring them to seek truth, believe in true God, he is a bad man because he's out to convert. Now, this is a mindset. And part of the problem is that far too many Indian Hindus have become editors on Wikipedia. So this problem may not be that bad uh, uh, with reference to Africa, but it is terrible with reference to Christianity in India that Wikipedia is a um, intellectual idea which is attacking and critiquing the whole concept to go out and disciple nation, turning people from falsehood, myths to truth, um, etc. Now within America, USA, uh, some of my very good friends who have been involved in supporting uh, this book project, uh, individually, those great people who are seeking to serve USA are condemned uh, by Wikipedia, and in because, say, for example, they don't they think that homosexuality is sin, and uh, Wikipedia is not going to take neutrality on this moral issue to present both sides those who promote homosexuality, those who think this is sinful. Uh, and neutrality means that Wikipedia should be presenting both sides, uh, but it has made a commitment and it is attacking. In one particular case, I met a businessman, a manufacturer uh, just a month ago, six weeks ago in uh, Tennessee. 
Wikipedia is asking customers, uh, readers, not to buy his products because he, he doesn't believe, he doesn't approve of homosexuality. So this uh, a tool that is being used for education, which has uh, a, taken a very explicit anti-Christian, anti-biblical line uh, on, I'm giving just a few hints to you, but uh, since Ashish is not here, he's uh, suffering with COVID, therefore he's not here with us. Uh, please do pray for him and his wife, Pooja. Uh, but um, the, the, the part of this whole third education revolution is to pick up the original proposal for encyclopedia, which begins with Francis Bacon, climaxes with John Amos Comenius, that we are requesting you as Christian scholars in Africa, a you know, hundred of you, please take up one subject, research it, write it, even if you write only hundred words on that one subject, get it peer reviewed, critical, uh, allow your wives, your husbands, your friends to criticize what you're writing. Work with editor, improve upon it, submit it, and by the time we meet in August uh, in a face-to-face -face, uh, conference, in-person conference, uh, we should have 100 articles, 200 articles from Africa uh, to begin to launch. Now, we have to do this globally, of course, uh, but you know, we need to get 10,000 Christian scholars creating a new encyclopedia, which is interested in seeking truth which is interested in holiness, righteousness, character. That's why we need a scholars forum. Now, those of you who begin to write out of that, some of you might begin to help create curriculum. I mentioned that we need a high school diploma that must be a million pastors, including in South America and many of the Asian countries outside of Africa, including those pastors who are leaders, who care for their sheep, who have built churches, but they don't have a high school diploma. So they cannot really become academic pastors. So we need a curriculum online, uh, which will equip them to get an accredited high school diploma. There will be political legal battles in making sure that these pastors who are studying, you know, learning, reading, writing, language and mathematics, basic science, um, uh, social sciences, but they are also studying world history, world views, world religions, and they get a high school diploma. If someone can do it in six months, fine. If someone takes two years to get that high school diploma, that's fine. But this would qualify them to uh, get admitted in a undergraduate program, bachelor's program, and they need the BA degree, BA in applied theology, to become academic pastors. A part of that a degree, as I mentioned a few before the break, will require them to understand economics and understand banking, because they would be working as banking agents um, so that poor children can get the best education by borrowing money to get a laptop, pay for the tuition, pay for software, et cetera. And uh, so that those who are creating curriculum, that is you, uh, you get paid for what you're doing. And uh, we are not seeking to exploit you, but you get paid because the children and their parents are able to borrow money. But this means that you know, Christians have to get into banking. Christian leadership in many countries unfortunately during the last 50 years has degenerated to mean a person's ability to raise money. If you are a good fundraiser, you can raise lots of money, you are a leader. No, uh, what we are saying, and one of the point of Jason Benedict's lecture was that a real leader is one who is creating money, producing money. Uh, you, you're given seed, that's what bank loan is, well, you have to turn it into 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold so that you can return uh, what, what was given to you. 
and that money is used to bless others. So all of this, uh, the, you know, the billion dollars being made available for educational banking in um, Africa is a very dangerous thing because a lot of people who want to be uh, abuse that money will be, become interested in this project. Well, you've heard of several times that uh, uh, the whole team, many of the, who are present here, have produced this book, which is 756 pages. And, uh, uh, but what you have not been told is that uh, the practical application of that book has been uh, converted into a 20 year business plan, uh, which is um, looking at this whole idea. Jason has a whole chapter on it, on how do we, the, how do we, it's called the business of educating the poor. Ashish Alexander has a chapter on encyclopedia, and there are several others here. Bruce Friesen would be uh, speaking at the end. Uh, he has a chapter on uh, discipling nations through education, uh, etc. I won't mention all the chapters that are 29 chapters, uh, but um, the, uh, the, these are not theoretical ideas up in the air. They have been translated into a 20-year business plan so that we can actually implement a revolution in which the church takes education back. It is the church that has been given the responsibility to disciple nations. And we cannot hand it over to the state. Why? simply because government is not an institution that is baptized with the spirit of truth. Government, Supreme Courts, Parliament, Senate, they don't know what is male or female. They don't know what is marriage. They don't know what is love. They don't know what is adultery, what is divorce. They don't know what is justice. So they might be highly educated Supreme Court judges, but state is not an institution that is baptized with the spirit of truth. Church is the institution that is baptized with the spirit of truth. It's a fellowship, a body that is baptized with the spirit of truth, which is spirit of wisdom, knowledge, understanding. Not that everything that the church says and does and teaches is true. There's a lot of error in what the church believes and teaches. But the church is responsible to seek truth. And the church is a community of humble people who realize that we cannot rely on our own wisdom. We cannot rely on our own feelings. For example, loving my wife is not my value. I'd rather love my neighbor's wife because she never asked me to mop the floor and wash dishes and change diapers. Um, it's much easier to love a woman who, with whom you can have intelligent conversations about um, stock market and this, that, and the other. Um, loving, love your own wife, not your neighbor's wife, is an obligation. It's a command and I have to obey. It's not a story that God told Moses. It's a command. So. Um, it may be counterintuitive when the Lord says, husbands, love your wife. I say, but now look at the wife you gave me. And he says, no, 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 no. You don't look at the wife I gave you. You look at the wife I gave to my son, the bride. Old, ugly, full of wrinkles, dirty, filthy. And that's you. You are the bride I gave to my son so that he might shed his blood to wash you, make you clean. Now, if we are going to create stable families, we have to get rid of this whole secular language of values. These are not human values or universal values. It has never been a universal value for husbands to love their wives. Every culture, including Jewish culture, has allowed husbands to divorce their wives, to take a new wife, or to take more than one wife is one is not good enough. These are commands. I don't have the ability to love my wife because I get angry. 
Well, that's why I need grace. That's why I need the Holy Spirit. The Lord, you're commanding me to love this woman. Right now, I'm angry at this woman. I hate this woman. For me to find grace to repent for my sin and to love someone who I prefer to hate, uh, find that grace. This is the shaping of character to becoming Christ-like that he loved his enemies, those who hated him, those who mocked him, those who crucified him, um, th that he shed his blood for them to wash his bride with his blood, to make her holy, to make her beautiful. Uh, if he's, she is not holy enough, this is my responsibility to make her holy, make her beautiful, etc. So we won't go into a discussion of ethics and morality. Uh, and Andreas um, Wieland has a very good chapter on education, loss of uh, character building and the recovery of character will building, which is part of this education revolution. But I'm just pointing out with all the nonsense that the Christian universities talk about um, human values. These are not human values, these are God's commands that you shall not covet, you shall not steal, you shall not take bribes, you shall not abuse the money that is entrusted to you uh, to use for helping the poorest of the kids to get educated. And th that attitude has to be, if the educational banking has to survive, a character has to be built in through the church, in parents, in children, students, graduates, etc., so that that money actually grows and the investors who are investing on that money could actually be, they, they could have the trust that if I invest money in Congo, in educating the poorest, giving them the best, world's best education, um, my money will actually grow because I'm planting seed uh, in a good soil. And that's the church's role, the pastor's roles, the pulpit's role uh, to create that soil, to prepare that soil for sowing of the seed. Um, so I won't develop more on it, but except that we, we you need to come um, to, in August to in-person um, summit so that we can begin to develop and strategize and establish leadership in different countries uh, so that these things can be implemented. But right now what I'm saying is that why do we need a scholars forum? We need a scholars forum because we need you to help create an encyclopedia. This is the education ecosystem. You cannot have the devil create the education ecosystem and you be content in teaching uh, the kids, math or social sciences or whatever in your uh, primary school. So our mindset that we want the elementary school, we don't want to create an encyclopedia. That's a problem. We need scholars because we need you to create the textbooks. We need you to create online curriculum. We can't do it. We need you to create online curriculum all the way from kindergarten um, which is cartoons and music and stories to the postgraduate level. I mentioned yesterday, in just in case some of you are not there, that we need at least 25 universities in Africa that are building the best research faculties. So one university should spend, we're budgeting three, four million dollars uh, for each university to build one or two first class research centers so that any Muslim who wants to study nanotechnology, he chooses a Christian university or microbiology or physics or chemistry or politics or history or business or economics. If you're, you're doing PhD, you want to go to the Christian universities because they are offering the best at teaching and uh, they will pay, they will borrow money from commercial banks or from their families uh, to pay the Christian university 
if the PhD that you're offering is the very best. Now, how are we going to choose which universities should be supported? Uh, that's, that's where we need you. So we need you to do the research, uh, talk to the universities in your countries and to see what is feasible, what is possible, uh, what would it actually take to build uh, these universities uh, uh, to have one or two or three, um, um, the Africa's best research facilities should be with Christians because you're not just educating a little child in a little village uh, in a jungle or in a valley or in a slum. You want to take him to a point that he or she can have the possibility of doing as good a research as they would do in MIT or Stanford or Harvard or Oxford or wherever. That's what needs to happen in Africa if Africa has to become the light to the nation's light to the world. So why do we need scholars forum for this third education revolution? Um, uh, allow me because the time is so limited to jump. We are out to create a new Pope. Now we have one father with us and I'm very grateful because I'm hoping that the Roman Catholic Church and their abilities will come in, the, in this education revolution. Uh, so please don't get offended if I say uh, there's something shocking that we're asking you to become the new Pope. You realize that Roman Catholic Church invented the institution of the university, beginning with Bologna in Italy. Martin Luther is a Roman Catholic monk teaching in a Roman Catholic university. All the early universities received their charter from the Pope. Why? Because Pope was the intellectual authority. Whole of Europe, uh, that's including Eastern and Western Europe, had a reserve bank of intellectual capital. And that reserve bank was the church. Pope was the head of the church. Therefore, he was the final intellectual authority in Europe. Now, they called him the infallible voice of God. You may fight about whether he was infallible or not, or fallible. That's not my point. But that uh, the phrase that infallibility of voice of infallible voice of God meant that the Pope was the intellectual authority in Europe. When the ref reformers undermined uh, pe papacy, the institution of the Pope, they took the intellectual authority from the Pope, who did, they, who did they give it to? Well, people like Martin Luther, uh, they were not revolutionaries in the sense that they, they were not trying to get power for themselves. Luther was not trying to become a bishop or a Pope or uh, um, chancellor, vice chancellor of a university. They, they were fighting for truth. He was hiding in the castle of Wartburg translating when he was kidnapped and he was hiding there, he was translating the New Testament, but he didn't have the peer review. He didn't have the facility to consult others. And he had not actually studied Greek and Hebrew um, because Greek and Hebrew were not commonly taught subjects in Europe at that time. Greek had just come, Hebrew was still poorer, uh, but Erasmus, for example, was a Greek expert, but he was in Cambridge although he was Dutch. So when Luther returns to Wittenberg, his colleagues, younger colleagues, people like Philip Melanchthon, who knew Greek better, they would meet with Luther every frequently, every week, tell him that in this pa passage that he has translated, he hasn't understood the word of God correctly here. He has made mistakes there. What is the correct translation, etc. So Luther was learning from his peers. So what happened as a result of that, Reformation takes 
authority, intellectual authority from the Pope, gives it to the university. Now that tradition continues till today. University professors may be very foolish and lots of them are very ignorant and very foolish, but when New York Times wants, to, wants you to believe something or Los Angeles Times or Wall Street Journal wants you to believe something, it will begin a story by saying that professor so-and-so in the University of Chicago had conducted a study and came to this conclusion and his conclusion are independently verified by a professor in Beijing or Tokyo. Why? Because this media expects people to respect the conclusions of a university professor, uh, even if he's a fool, even if he's talking nonsense. Who gave this authority to the university? It was the Protestant Reformation that gave the authority to the university because at that time, professors were submitting their minds to God's revelation. God is the source of truth. Now, allow me to take a few minutes uh, to explain why this is so important. I was studying philosophy in the University of Allahabad, uh, by 1969, I was just completing uh, my undergraduate degree. And I realized that I cannot really believe the Bible to be true. Why not? My pastors believe the Bible, but my pastors are not as educated and as learned as my professors. My professors are a lot more learned. They don't believe the Bible. Why should I believe the Bible to be true, to be God's word? So I cannot honestly say that I believe the Bible is God's word. But doubting the Bible was very easy. What then do you believe? I decided that I'm going to believe what the best philosophers and scientists and historians believe to be true. So what do they believe is the truth? I began to review my course in philosophy, both Western philosophy and Eastern philosophy. And the, no, I'm reading my notes that I've taken in the class and I'm reading the textbooks, etc. And I begin to realize that my professors who were teaching me for all these two years, my professors knew that the philosophers knew that they did not know the truth. And Western philosophy had reached the same point which Indian philosophy had reached uh, 600 years, 700 years before Christ is that human brain cannot know the truth. Human language, human words cannot communicate truth. Brain is not an instrument of knowing truth. Truth is a theological idea. That brain is, a mind is more than the brain. There is soul. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. He knows what he dreamt. Nobody else does. Daniel prays. God reveals the dream to Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel goes and tells the king, this is what you dreamt. The king is astonished. You know, my wife has been, chief queen has been fighting for two, two nights, three nights that I don't call her if I don't tell her my dream. I haven't told my dream to any, anyone. How do you know? Well, there is a God who reveals. Did Daniel know the truth? Yes, because King knew what the dream was. And he confirmed, yes, Daniel uh, uh, is telling the truth because God's spirit can reveal the truth to him. Now, the people in the court they didn't know what Nebuchadnezzar's dream was. They didn't know how Daniel got to know the secret, but they had a good reason to believe that Daniel's words are true because the king told them that yes, Daniel's words are true. Language reveals truth. God made us in his image means that he gave us mind, he gave us the gift of language, he gave us the gift of logic and intuition and imagination, etc. because he wants us to know truth. 
Now, God's word doesn't reveal all the truth. This is a problem with fundamentalism, with evangelicalism, that we think that God's words alone is sufficient. So the comments that was made that many churches establishing uh, theological schools, they're making a mistake because the heart of the Protestant movement, the birth of modern age, recognized very clearly that all truth is not revealed in God's word. Sadducees come to Jesus and they say that here's this woman, she was married to seven brothers, all seven of them died, whose wife will she be in heaven? Jesus says, you are in error because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. What's the power of God? Heavens declare the glory of God. You have to study the word of God and you have to study the works of God. What are the works of God? God has worked in nature. God has worked in culture, in history. He has worked in Uganda. God is not an absentee landlord. He's active in African history. We have to study what God has done to know the truth. We have to study history, archaeology, geology, um, chemistry, et cetera, et cetera. We have to study. So when Cambridge University built the first scientific lab, it's called Cavendish Lab, at the entrance of the Cavendish Laboratory was written Psalm 111 verse two. Majestic are the works of the Lord. Those who delight in them, study them. It's not just God's word is majestic. God's works are majestic. And those who love their father, they don't just study God's word. They study also God's works. But the whole Reformation mindset which created the university movement, it understood that uh, God's word and his works do not simply reveal truth. God's word also conceals truth. That's Proverbs 25, 2. The glory of God is to conceal a matter. The glory of kings is to find it out. So some of you said that you're PhD students. Once you have discovered something which your professors didn't know, your university didn't know, you write your thesis, you defend your thesis, you will be honored because the glory of human beings is to find out the truth that God has hidden. So God works conceal. You see the sun rising, you see the sun setting. Is the sun moving around? No, when you see the moon appearing as full moon today, and two weeks later, no moon, uh, and you begin to wonder why is Saturn rising here and Venus rising here today, and there tomorrow, when you begin to explore the, all these things, then you begin to think maybe the best explanation of this phenomenon of the solar system is that the earth is rotating and the earth is revolving around the sun. Even though you don't experience the earth rotating, you live on the sun, you don't see the earth revolving. But the phenomenon of nature is a treasure hunt. You have to use your mind your mathematics, your imagination, to imagine that perhaps the opposite of what you see, you see the sun rising and setting, but the truth is the sun is not rising or setting, earth is rotating and revolving. So the works of God conceal, that's why you need to study science. And those who love their father do not simply study his word, but even the word of God conceals truth. This was fundamental to people like Francis Bacon and John Amos Comenius and all the people who pioneered the modern world. Jesus tells a parable uh, that a sower went out and he sowed the seed in some by the roadside, some on the stones, some in the bush, some in the good soil. And then he tells another parable that a sower went out, he sowed a good seed in his crop, but when the, on his field, but when the seed sprouted, there was also tear, there was weeds. Uh, the disciples get very upset at Jesus. Why can't you be like an American 
preacher who tells two jokes and three points and one application. Why do you have to be like these Indian preachers who go on rambling in circles? You, why do you talk in parables? And nobody understands these parables. You're a very poor communicator. That's what the disciples are saying to Jesus. And Jesus simply smiles and he says, I tell parables because I'm God. The glory of God is to conceal a matter. It's your job to find out the truth. That's why education is needed, university is needed, research is needed, because the glory of God is not just to reveal truth, but hide truth. So the churches that are establishing just theological colleges in the church are making a mistake because they're repeating the error of fundamentalism, which has ruined American Christianity during the last hundred years with its anti-intellectualism. Um, we, we would discuss more of this epistemology. How do we know truth? Why do we need research? Why do we need universities? And to recover the power of the uh, Protestant movement, which created the modern world. Um, the finest of it was in Harvard University's shield, but I better not go into that discussion. The point that I'm making is that and in the university, studying the university made me lose my faith in the Bible as God's revelation. I doubted the Bible. The question came up, what then do you believe? I said, I will believe what the best philosophers and scientists and historians believe. What do they know is think is the truth. And I began studying them. I found out that by the time of uh, Wittgenstein in Cambridge, uh, the end of enlightenment philosophy, the enlightenment philosophers gave up hope that human mind, human brain can, they didn't even know whether brain and mind are two different things, that human mind uh, cannot know the truth, human words cannot communicate truth. That's when deconstructionism began, that the role of the university professor is to deconstruct every truth claim. He doesn't claim that he knows the truth. He just knows that nothing that anybody says is truth can be true. Uh, so, the, so the university's job is now to deconstruct. This cannot be moral, this cannot be true, um, which, which is a whole deception of the devil. The university has become the West's source of darkness. So the, the Protestant movement took the intellectual authority from the Pope, gave it to the university, but for financial reasons, primarily, the, the church handed over the university to the state. And state is not an institution baptized with the spirit of truth. Um, in, in America, just briefly, the problem came with the First World War. After World War I, a lot of veterans, war veterans, they were young men, returned to America after the war. And they found that their jobs had been taken over by women. They were running the banks, post offices. They were driving buses and etc. The women had taken over jobs. And the machines were milking the cows. So these boys cannot go back to their father's farm and milk the cows because now machines are milking the cow. So what are they going to do? Well, we have to educate them, establish new colleges. And, uh, the, but the church by then has very little money to establish new colleges to train all of these young people. That's when the state began funding uh, the colleges. And uh, it just so happened that people like John Dewey were a philosopher of education that had taken over the strategic position intellectually and uh, practically, politically, uh, to influence the course of the university. And then they replaced the Bible as the source of light, source of truth, with pragmatism. Positivism was a philosophy that developed in England, in Europe, particularly in Cambridge. Pragmatism was a philosophy that developed in America and began to be applied to the university. So what is revolutionary about this third education revolution and why is it called the third education revolution is a legitimate question, but is 
that we are bringing education back, taking it back from the state, and that creates the financial challenges, also political and legal challenges, but bringing, giving it back to the church because it was the church that was commanded to go out and disciple nations. The meaning of the word discipleship has changed because of the corruption of evangelical theology in America. Um, the, what Jason said that to disciple means to educate. This was the part of the first education revolution that began in Europe in the eighth, ninth century under Charlemagne. Uh, Roman Empire had disintegrated. Charlemagne, a Frankish king, he rebuilds the Roman Empire. He thinks that to convert people means to baptize them. So he said that uh, to the pagans in Europe that you better take baptism, otherwise you will be killed because I'm out to convert you. That's my job to convert people. Alcuin, a British English theologian philosopher, he was returning from Rome uh, to England and he stopped on the way to meet with Charlemagne. And when he saw what Charlemagne was doing to convert people, uh, forcefully baptizing them, he said to him, that, no, 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 you're wrong. To convert means to educate. Holy Spirit must take God's law right into the hearts of people, transform people, change their hearts, change their mind, change their thinking. Now, uh, uh, Alcuin wasn't saying anything new because this is what uh, the apostle to Germany, um, uh, what's his name? Um, he had already said Boniface in Boniface, that to convert means to educate. That's what under the Charlemagne, the Emperor Charlemagne's, the first education revolution began once he understood that to convert means to disciple people, to educate people. Now, we've got into a problem that we think that to convert means to bring a sinner, to repeat a sinner's prayer. Once he has raised his hand, gone forward in a crusade, said his sinner's prayer, he's converted, he's saved. Now, that is as much a problem as um, Charlemagne's misunderstanding of what conversion really is. And that has created the problems that America is facing today, that you've had powerful big evangelists who saved tons of souls and lost the nation because they didn't even understand what conversion is, uh, what God is out to do, what the Holy Spirit are, is out to do. But I won't go into that controversy except to say that a revolution, or if you prefer to call it reformation, a reformation is a theological controversy. We've got to challenge what our church leaders and our seminaries and our theologians have believed, taught and practiced. Uh, we have to go back to the scriptures to find truth and we have to look into the history uh, of uh, what really does uh, discipling nations, how was it understood? Pioneer of modern missionary movement, such as William Carey, and um, Ruth and I wrote a book on William Carey, uh, how did they understand what it means to disciple India? Uh, but uh, unfortunately, I'm being provocative uh, because that's what a revolution is. Uh, I will not be answering <laughs> all, I don't have the time to answer all the questions and that's not my point right now, but I need to move towards uh, a climax by uh, repeating that we need scholars forum network because we need 10,000 scholars, Christian scholars to create this new encyclopedia. Why? because we want you to be the Pope. That's what Protestant Reformation did. Took intellectual authority from the Pope, gave it to the scholars in the university. But scholars who are humble enough to submit to each other's criticism, peer review, peer review. So the encyclopedia that you create should surpass in its content and quality things like Wikipedia or Encyclopedia Britannica, so that every student all over the world 
is at least has an option. He can look at Wikipedia, but he also looks at Collegepedia to which you are contributing. If you're not a good researcher, but you're a good editor, we need you. F from that e exercise, you begin to create textbooks, books, documentaries, podcasts, novels, films. You're creating a whole intellectual ecosystem which will disciple the nations. So um, how is all of this going to be financed, et cetera, and how is all of this going to be led? Uh, this is not a very centralized movement. Um, right now, what I would like to uh, challenge, and perhaps Bruce Friesen would talk more about it, we need you to start working on one book, the Bible's role in Africa's, modern Africa's past and future. What role has the Bible already played in making Kenya what it is today? The best features of Kenya, there are plenty of problems, but what is good in Kenya, where did it come from? What's the role that the Bible has played in Nigeria? What's the role that the Bible has played in Ghana or Uganda or South Sudan, etc.? So studying the history of your own countries. Now, each country probably needs a separate book, but if you begin with one chapter for each country or each topic, so we need someone from you to come forward, a group of you, I think, uh, 10, 20, 30 researchers together, creating one book to make the Bible the soul of Africa in the 21st century. That's the role we want you to play, that you need to research your own history on what the word of God has done and don't bother with secular historians and whether they would approve of what you're saying or disapprove of what you're saying. You need to study truth and you need to publish truth. So uh, if you've done one chapter on the Bible's role in Uganda, let's say, if the Ugandan group goes on to develop it as a whole book, that the Bible should be the soul of 21st century Uganda. That's great. But as a group, let's begin with one book for whole of Africa, uh, the goal is that we are taking on the challenge of secular humanism uh, that is undermining the confidence in the Bible, the very book that created modern Africa, the things that are good in Africa, uh, that is being undermined by diabolical deception. So one outcome of these two days of consultation should be that an Africa group is created. And we've just created a group like this in India. Uh, next Thursday, the group will meet where two doctors will present uh, a paper on the Bible's impact on medicine in India, healthcare in India. It will be critiqued, reviewed. They will go back, revise the chapter, and then have it edited, and it will be part of the book, the, what the Bible has done. We need a chapter on Bible's impact on agriculture in India, the Bible's impact on agricultural technology, the Bible's impact on the constitution and law of India and uh, language and literature. In one of my books, um, Ashish has contributed the chapter on encyclopedia. He's uh, written a chapter in my last book, uh, which is about how the Bible's impact on vernacular novels. The novel is a genre of literature that came out of the Reformation um, with uh, Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress being the proto-novel, uh, prototype, out of that grew all the novels. And when English literature came to India uh, through the missionary movement, it stimulated Indians to write the novel as an instrument reforming Indian culture. And that's a beautiful chapter, which he's developing into his own PhD thesis, that all of the early Indian novels in different languages in India are uh, expressing biblical worldview, even if the novelist is not a Christian. Um, I won't go into the details, but 
this is the kind of research that how profoundly the Bible has impacted Africa. We need you to research and write and publish. Now, I'm not sure uh, uh, the, how much the book, The Third Education Revolution is selling for as ebook in Africa, uh, but we will check it out and I'm sure we can have a special rate for Africa so it's affordable to you, but do invest in that because we need you to begin to think about how are we going to finance all of this? How are we going to create this encyclopedia or dictionary or you know, the new education system, et cetera? So uh, this is uh, the overview of the scholars becoming the new Pope, taking intellectual authority from the state and restoring it to the church. It needs reformation of the church. So, uh, because Luther was very clear, he began in 1517 when he nailed the 95 Thesis, he was calling for the reform of the church, reform of theology, because the corruption was coming from the Pope, from the Bishop, from the church. But then quickly Luther realized that Germany is not going to be reformed only if the church is reformed, the university has to be reformed. And most Protestants know that Luther called the Pope at the Antichrist. What they don't know is that Luther's view of Antichrist was very different than our view of the Antichrist. He called the Turks the Antichrist. He called Aristotle the Antichrist. Aristotle was the Antichrist in the university, as far as Luther is concerned. And if you don't know this, when he started teaching, the very first course that he taught in Wittenberg University was a course on the philosophy of Aristotle. And then he began to realize that since the impact of Thomas Aquinas and the influence of Aristotle on the intellectual life of Europe, the, what has corrupted the first education revolution, which begins with Charlemagne and Alcuin, uh, it is the influence of Aristotle and then later Plato. Plato's influence came later uh, on in Europe. I mean, a little bit was there already, but um, 50 years before Luther, Plato had become very influential and uh, the Greek philosophy had really messed up the first education revolution. Therefore, he began the second education revolution with his 1520 letter that I won't describe right now, but it is that second education revolution which has now become diabolical, destructive. And we need to launch a third education revolution, which takes education back, but it seeks to bring it under a church which is baptized with the spirit of wisdom, knowledge, understanding, holiness, counsel. So how do I conclude this talk? Why do we need a scholars forum? We need you to become a servant of the Lord who is seeking baptism of the Holy Spirit. You want to be baptized with the spirit of wisdom, knowledge, understanding, counsel, fear of the Lord. Why? So that through you, the knowledge of God, knowledge of truth might fill the earth, fill Africa as the waters cover the sea. That's your call. So you, you, when you begin to teach young people, parents, churches, what you're doing is filling Africa with the spirit of wisdom, knowledge, understanding with which you have been baptized. So uh, I conclude there. I'm not sure how much time I've taken, uh, but if there is still time for questions, I'll be happy to respond. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vishal, for that um, very comprehensive um, narration and telling and lecture on the third education revolution and how do we fit into all this. I, I think we have uh, people in the audience who would be interested in giving some comments and reactions to this. Um, and do feel free also as we go along to put any questions you may have. We have a, um, 
a good amount of time, about half an hour or so, where we can engage in questions and answers directly to Vishal, and even as we go along, reflections on the things that we have heard in these two days. So um, I'll hand over to Andreas. Um, are there some comments or questions that have come up that uh, we can highlight? Just one comment. Uh, I see Frank Carlson's note that the ebook is selling for ten pounds on Amazon. We've got to bring it down to four or five pounds in Africa. So we'll work on that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I got mine at ten dollars, um, which is slightly less than ten pounds. But um, yes, we definitely the African community we will appreciate because. We want this book to be available to very many, even those pastors we are talking about who may not have a lot of resources, but who will definitely benefit from this book. So thank you very much for that on behalf of everybody. Andreas, any question you want to highlight? But as we do that... Um... Thank you, Liz. Actually, there is not many questions, there is a few. I also had technical problems here coming in again. <laughs> Sorry. For, um, uh, many people are confirming what Michelle says. There is much um, um, confirming of, of the perspective of this scholars forum that is needed. And also the, especially the, the, this perspective of um, looking at the works of God. So that science as part of our task, not only scripture, but the, the words and the works of God. So that is what we what we see confirmed. Uh, but there is one question from LOD. Uh, except that we cannot talk about the break that mined the Bible in Africa without talking about modernism, or modernism is a wave that has come to us from the West. My question then will be to know what role will the West play in this process in order to deal with this break in the long term? Uh, is that understandable? Michelle, would you like to comment on that? Well, um, yes, thank you. We, the West has enormous intellectual resources that will, and financial resources and organizational abilities, including things like banking, et cetera. So we need all of that in Asia, in Africa, and South America. But the Western theology has also impacted uh, in a bad way, let me be brutal responding to the question that many churches are establishing these seminaries. The seminary movement is part of anti-intellectualism uh, that has grown during the last 150 years. Earlier, all the churches were establishing universities, beginning with the Roman Catholic Church. So if you wanted to be an Anglican minister, high quality, you went to Oxford or Cambridge. If you wanted to be a Presbyterian minister, you went to Aberdeen or Glasgow or um, et cetera in Scotland. If you wanted to be uh, a congregational minister, you went to Harvard University. So the church was establishing universities. After Deal Moody, the church gave up the university and started Moody Bible Institute and then other Bible institutes, so Wheaton, Dallas, Biola, Fuller, uh, that became the icons for the global Christianity, that if you want to train your Christian leaders, you send them to seminary. But the seminary movement itself was part of anti-intellectualism. How did that happen is a different question, which I'd be glad to explain. But we are trying to get the church out of that mindset that people, our church leaders need to go to need to be trained in theological seminaries because the theological seminaries as they have developed since Moody Bible Institute is an expression of anti-intellectualism in the Western church. So by returning to the university movement and bringing university under the Lordship of Christ, uh, we will challenge the American church uh, to get its act together. So Africa and Asia and South America have a role now to play in re-educating the West about its own history. 
So Martin Luther or John Calvin, they were not running Bible seminaries. Geneva University is what Calvin and Theodore Beza started as uh, the academy, Geneva Academy. Zurich University is what began with the Bible teaching of uh, Zwingli, uh, daily Bible teaching. So uh, the, the history of the, the West, the church historians uh, no longer know. And that's why uh, we should take the blessings from the West, but you have to bless the West. Yeah. Well, so, so, someone uh, has asked the question, is Kevin Swanson part of this movement? Yes, Kevin has endorsed the book, but Kevin, if you read Wikipedia article on Kevin Swanson, you see how horrible Wikipedia has become. So the Wikipedia article on Kevin Swanson is disgrace. And that's why we need a new, uh, uh, a new collegepedia side question, sorry. So yeah, absolutely. This has to be a partnership between East and West Africa and the West, but we're not accepting everything that has been practiced because Western Christianity, European Christianity has lost Europe. American Christianity has lost America. And therefore we have to look at that Christianity critically. There's a comment here from Innocent Solomon. I think it reflects perhaps what others may be feeling at this point. We shall just turn my theology in some sense. Thank you, Prof. I feel like going to your school of theology, theology right ahead. Um, and I think that's a sentiment that must be um, felt by many as we consider what really do the scriptures teach and is that what we have believed. Um, there had been a question by Bruce. I think you've covered some of that. Please provide more details about the specifics of what is wrong with fundamentalism. Um, and I think some of that was what you're The word about. fundamentalism came out of Biola. Biola was not a university, now it is, but Biola was Bible Institute of, uh, no. Los Angeles, Bible Institute of Los Angeles. That's what Biola is, Bible Institute of Los Angeles, which was like Moody Bible Institute model. So uh, before that in America, what you had was Puritanism and liberalism and modernism came. You see, uh, America's problem really began on 4th of July, 1776, when the Declaration was, of Independence was accepted. Uh, Jefferson wrote, we hold these truths to be sacred that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creators. So by this phrase, we hold these truths to be sacred, he meant that these are truths revealed to us in sacred scriptures. It was changed under pressure from Benjamin Franklin, we hold these truths to be self-evident. It was never self-evident in America to anybody that slaves and slave owners are equal. This was revealed. Men and women are equal was never self-evident to anybody in America. Um, Martin Luther discovers the idea of human equality in the doctrine of priesthood and kingship of all believers. He didn't talk too much about kingship but he focused on, um, for a number of reasons, on priesthood of all believers, but the priesthood and kingship of all believers, that's where the idea of human equality developed, because at that time, at Luther's time, if you went to church, you didn't sing, only the priests sang, or those who were trained to be priests. You got the body of Jesus Christ, you didn't get the wine, the blood. So there was a distinction between laity and clergy. Reformation was destroying and there were big fights over whether everybody should get the wine. So the idea of human equality develops in Germany, which leads to the Peasants War in 1524, 25. In America, George Whitfield is the one who begins to teach human equality on the basis of the Bible, 
from 1740, he writes regular columns on the subject, the Bible teaches human equality. That is what created the intellectual consensus in America that all men are created equal. And Jefferson faithfully recorded that in the original draft, but for because of some mistakes committed by the apologist, Thomas Reed in Scotland, the idea of common sense as an epistemological idea became important in America. And uh, American theology began to quote Romans 1, Romans 2, this, that, and the other, affirming faith in common sense rather than divine revelation. That created a problem in 30 years by 1805, 1805 is the year when Harvard University was lost. In 1805, uh, there were a number of very good Christians in Harvard, godly men who began to say that, look, I believe in common sense. It's not self-evident to me that one father, one son, one Holy Spirit, one, one, one equals one. I can't believe in Trinity with of believing in common sense. This is not common sense that there's father of son and Holy Spirit are distinct, but there's only one God. So in 1805, Unitarians won the control of the board of Harvard. Trinitarians were very angry and they began to fight in election after election to take back the control of Harvard University. But instead of winning Harvard back, the Trinitarians began to lose Princeton and Yale and Vanderbilt and all the Ivy League colleges. So by the time of D.L. Moody, which is 80, 80 years later, the evangelical community in uh, America said, oh, reason is a problem, mind is a problem, university is a problem, studying science is a problem, don't send your children to the university, they will lose faith. These were all universities created by Trinitarian Christianity. So let's build Bible Institute and send our kids to the Bible Institute, then they will remain pure in their faith. So that's how this anti-intellectualism began to, with the Moody Bible Institute, develop the seminary movement which took over, it became the norm that Christians should not have university education, Christian leadership should have seminary education. And this is what has got to be changed because um, I haven't gone into a discussion of the Harvard Shield, uh, which was a product of John Amos Comenius's epistemology, how do we know truth? Uh, and Veritas, which is your organization in Africa, and Harvard Shield, Veritas is written on three books, V-E-R-I-T-A-S. These are book of God's words, book of God's works, both in nature and in culture, and the book of God's uh, mind, in human mind, if my soul is made in God's image, there is a great deal I can learn about looking at my own logic, reason, music, ethics, my moral sense, aesthetics, imagination, etc. So we must study all of this. Now, the, there were weaknesses in that epistemology, which we don't need to discuss today, but Harvard Shield was the climax of the Protestant epistemology that had been developing uh, from uh, people like Francis Bacon uh, climaxed in Comenius. Comenius was in England uh, in uh, 1643 when Winthrop, the governor of New England, came to London and Samuel Hartley organized meeting between Comenius and uh, Winthrop. Winthrop invited um, Comenius to come to America, become the president of Harvard, but he chose to go to Sweden for uh, political reasons. He was hoping that the king of Sweden, uh, after the 30-year war, will help his land to be given back to Moravian brethren, etc. So he didn't come to Harvard, but 
as Winthrop returned to Harvard, he took Comenius's philosophy of how do we know truth? And that's how the Harvard shield Veritas was created. Now, we need to go into the details of the discussion, but not today. But the point is that Christian epistemology is in a mess today. And a whole new understanding of what is truth, how do we know truth, how do we uh, discover truth. Now in this context, uh, what the, 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 this was Puritan ideas, which came from Cambridge to Harvard actually. Uh, most of the Harvard University in New England was impacted by Emmanuel College in Cambridge. But uh, the, uh, the uh, term fundamentalism emerged out of the Moody Bible Institute, but it really was a series of books published in Biola uh, that um, shaped, but then the word fundamentalism became an embarrassment. Therefore, the American Christianity began to use the word evangelicalism instead of fundamentalism. But a lot of the evangelicalism is in fact fundamentalism, though the evangelicals are ashamed to call themselves fundamentalism. Uh, fundamentalists, um, um, but all of this has got to be, well, much of it has already been studied, but it is not taught uh, in our seminaries and to our uh, professors of theology, um, because this um, requires freedom and the freedom of thought. That's what a reformation is, that people are looking at truth once again. So. Uh, I love the word evangelical, I love the word fundamental, but we've got to look at these words and we have got to look at our own traditions critically if we are going to shape the future. Michelle, thank you very much. Um, your answer is raising lots of new questions I see coming in, which we cannot, which we cannot really tackle, but I would like to suggest uh, that there are so many questions here that are so important and that need, really need to, to be talked about and not just in a two minute answer. So my suggestion is that all of you who have these questions really think about and pray about joining us uh, in August for, for the real in-person conference. Um, and if I would really already now mention, like to mention that if you, uh, would like to be part of this uh, this movement and would like to come, but you say, I don't have the resources to move, uh, then please come up to us and and we, we cannot promise anything. We don't have any money yet. Even myself and Vishal and most of these people here are not being paid for what we do, but the Lord is in control. So if we want this revolution in Africa to happen, the money will be there. So. Uh, don't, don't let that stop you. If you have the, the, the resonance that the Lord is saying to you, uh, you should be part of this. And the questions that you're asking show me that you are buying into the vision that you want to have concrete, practical next steps. Um, and I love that. Um, so please think about and pray about joining us in August for the in-person conference we plan. Um, I, I would like to have one or two more people just give a short statement at this point. So we have a broader uh, perspective of others also from the African side uh, talking about what we do here. Um, there is Reverend Francis Canon Omondi. Uh, Francis Omondi, would you like to say a word please? Sean, could you please give him speaking rights? Francis Amondi, are you here? Yes, I am. Please. Give us okay. a one minute welcome and tell us who you are. Okay, my name is Francis Omondi, and I'm in the Anglican Church first as a minister, but my task had been to 
open up the northern part of this country, uh, the areas among Muslim people. So uh, that's where I've worked. But uh, over 30 years now, we just, uh, our main work was to open up school among them so that through this, we may bridge gaps that had existed because Muslims had followed a different epistemology, I mean, a different set of learning in the Madras and were not yet uh, attuned to the present education system. So we wanted to put these two together so that they too can come to learn through questioning, through understanding in the manner that we have. So in the process, we found ourselves opening them towards reasoning and challenging from the basic level. See, they had learned more through the idea of memory. What is taught is taken without question or verification. But when we came in, we helped them to start questioning and establishing the basis of what is true, what is right in that manner. So we set up an education system, our plan that enabled them us to challenge what is true. Can we verify, can we work with it? And that helped us in a way to help them question back their faith, question back what what there is, and uh, in a way, Christianity uh, sipped through the form of learning that was meant to, see, we don't, there is no truth that is Christian or not. Truth is out there that can be verified, and actually God is truth. <laughs> and uh, what, what knowledge he gives us helps us to understand this. So for us, it was a way that helped us remove barriers. But apart from that, it enabled us also to question and have them to question back their faith in order to compare with what they had never known. Uh, it's a model we've tried and we've been very happy that it worked well. And uh, interestingly, many came to learn and to want to say, can, we, can you teach us how to do this? So over 80, uh, oh, oh, hundreds of other schools have started with this model, but they never knew what they were doing. So in a way, God has helped us to open up an area that had been locked out for knowledge. There, and, and we are glad to have made a contribution in, in that way. Thank you. I'm um, following this, and I'm glad that we can uh, begin to discuss issues. Uh, one thing that I've, that recently, this corona thing has come to help us to understand, or what I understand is that there are two ways of, knowing. okay, in, in the basic theory of education, we have the three, the, the, the psychomotor, the skill learning, uh, the, 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 the area of appreciation, the attitude learning, and also the knowledge learning. We need to have a, a way of training people in attitude, the, the attitude learning, which is not provided for in school. And that is where I say we needed to block out the first three or seven years of a child to be taught Christian epistemology, to be taught the attitude, to, to, to shape them, and to, be, to learn Christian apologetics before they are poured out into other skill learning. I, I think we, we, a time where we can lock out and say we want a totally Christian thing, we may lock ourselves out of other legitimate areas of learning than work out with a base. So I wished we learned both Greek, Hebrew and encourage our people to know, to, to teach from the Bible, to use Bible as the base in those first 10 years of a child before mm. they come out to learn other knowledge that they shall have been formed or shaped through Christian education uh, before they face the other challenges. Uh, it's something I'm working on and I, I feel 
Thank you. Francis, Before we increased knowledge in other areas, this would have been what should have helped us shape and shape the conscience of a child towards Christianity yeah. from the beginning. Francis, I need to stop you because I have a few other I goals. have no more words because you are totally surprised me. I wasn't prepared to talk. <laughs> no, that's good. That's all good. I, I love what you say. And yes. we will love to hear more of that when we get together. I hope you can join us. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Francis. Okay. I would like to call, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, Ike or Ike, Aneliaku. She has raised her hand. I think it is a lady, if I see right. Please. Thank you. It's actually a man using okay. his wife's photograph. No, no problem. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to congratulate uh, Dr. Mangalwadi and the rest. Mine is just a contribution. I've looked at the dynamics of what we have shared so far on this platform and uh, coming from the angle of leadership and governance and then power dynamics, Professor Yusuf Turaki will understand what I'm heading to. In Africa, power is key. I don't want to talk about other nations, but power is very key. Power is influence. I would think that this movement would be successfully faster or faster successfully as the case may be in any instance, if we find a way to also engage those that are in positions of authority, as well as find a way to integrate into the entire concept the issue of getting believing Christians, not just those that answer Christians by name, Peter, Paul, and they are worse than Mohammed and what have you, getting them into a place that they understand why they should get involved in governance. You don't give what you don't have. The journey will be much faster. Reference what is going on in Nigeria under Buhari and what went on in Tanzania under John Magafuli. So if you look at these two case studies, you will see that it is very important to look out for power, find a way to encourage believing Christians to have access to power. That would help us to drive our processes and our revolution faster. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Yes, that's a very good and valid comment. And we, we do already work on that mode, thank you. I would also like to ask um, Mrs. Alero Otobo, uh, when you're here, um, to just ch share a very short uh, sentence, if you can. Maybe she uh, she's, can. she's not online anymore. Okay, okay. Uh, then I would like Neil, Neil Twa again. Um, are you here, Neil? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Go ahead, Neil. Okay. Share a very short uh, input from your side, please. I, I'm going to try. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to say thank you again for Vishal and everyone for sharing. I'm, I'm learning a lot and I'm open to learn more as we engage. Um, uh, my experience, I lived in Sierra Leone, West Africa for uh, four years and we had, uh, it's there also about 60% Muslim nations. Um, so we understand that challenge as well. Uh, we had 50 plus schools there, uh, some of them government schools who asked us to manage their schools. Uh, some private schools uh, that became some of the top schools in the country. And we also tried to make our private schools the cheapest of all other private schools. So it's been benchmarked in such a way that uh, it's, it's very affordable. Um, and even Muslims would send their children to our schools uh, because they recognize the quality they're getting and the discipline and, um, you know, from, from their kids. Um, then we also had a college that originally had only theology, but later added administrative subjects as well, so that we could also influence on accounting, uh, you know, uh, community development and, and other leadership and other uh, training um, to educate the people. Um, and then what we did with the college, we had five campuses on district headquarter towns in order to bring the education closer to the people, uh, because some people work full time and they hand to mouth. So if they don't work, they don't get money to look after their families. Uh, so we had those satellite uh, campuses in order to do intensives with them once a month so that they can get education 
then I wanted to say also something that was very important for our strategy was leadership strategy, because you can't maintain something like this without having the right leaders in place. So we had church planting, we planted about 40 churches every single month, uh, especially also among Muslim areas, um, um, including Jos, Nigeria, Northern Nigeria. Uh, those had to be in secret, in, in hiding, uh, training local leaders who would go out we planted over 100, uh, 100 uh, churches in about two years, and that work continues. Um, so in order to sustain that, we had to raise up leaders. And I think the key with leadership, as we know in Africa, the main challenge is leadership. But I, I did say the main challenge is actually discipleship, because we saw uh, the original disciples that Jesus raised, the original 12 were disciples, and they became the apostles, uh, who then influenced the entire world from that. So. I think if we can raise up disciples who are leaders in their communities, who make other disciples, we could really uh, influence. And then the, the resource strategy, how to sustain this. We had uh, quite a bit of local funds as well uh, through agriculture projects, uh, local businesses, guest houses, and so forth. And then we would also go to the USA, Canada, South Africa, and so on uh, to engage individuals as well as churches, NGOs, uh, and sometimes big businesses, uh, whether it's Microsoft or other big businesses who want to give into, uh, you know, social development, etc. And then grants, we, we will write grants and get some money through grants to do transformational leadership. And they will use that uh, to impact our communities. Um, uh, so I think that's just something that I wanted to share uh, briefly. Um, obviously, we would be very structured as well. Each district had a district coordinator with a leadership team. We wanted our leaders to learn how to lead with teams. So to break that uh, big man syndrome, you know, in Africa, we have the, the big man of God syndrome. And if he doesn't do it, then no one can do it. So, so we wanted our leaders to lead with teams. And we even did internal audits as well as external audits, which was important for our fundraising as well. So we had to prove that we've got proper uh, governance in place. Uh, so I think in brief, this is just something that I wanted to share. And then we had online as well. Currently, our Every Nation Global, we've got 80 countries. We do an online theology course. It's called uh, Lead 215, which is an online theology course that we do in all countries. Uh, and uh, it's completely online. Those who don't have a good uh, connection with internet, we also have uh, MP3, uh, which is a lower data connection. Uh, so I think these are some strategies that people can look at to, to move the education forward. Thank you, Neil, that's very helpful. Um, although we are already a little bit out of time, I would like to call two more people. Um, Bishop Mark Wamala, are you here? Bishop Mark Wamala, are you here? Can you hear us? Yes, I am. Please speak yes, to us I for am. a minute. <laughs> yes, um, thank you so much for the contribution. These two days have been great days of learning. I want to appreciate the speakers. They have been right to the point. I am Mark Wamala. I'm the General Secretary of the National Fellowship of Born Again, Pentecostal Churches of Uganda. Um, a fellowship which brings about over 30,000 churches together. I have great memories of um, uh, Vishal when he visited Uganda and he really shared the vision. And I want to thank um, my minister, I call her Honorable Minister, uh, Dr. Gideon Kassirie, who has contributed very well towards this um, education revolution. Um, just what I want to confirm need is real. As a general secretary, I'm in charge of the administration of the fellowship, that many number of churches. And the challenge we have is our pastors need to be helped. This idea of academic, uh, uh, academic pastor is very, very much needed because they have the congregation, they have the people coming, sitting under them and they don't have all it takes really to have them uh, transformed and also transform the community. So this uh, third education revolution 
is much, much welcome. I just pray that all um, of us we come onto this platform so that we, we are able to uh, help ourselves and help the people we are leading and eventually transform uh, uh, our nations. I'm sure Africa is going to be transformed. And this what we have begun. It may seem to be small and right where we are now, but if we really resolve to take it, or as we say, take the, the, the bull by the horns, we are going to make it. So I just want to thank all of you. Please encourage you. Let's hold on to this vision. It is going to bring some fruit. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Very appreciated that you are here. Yes. Can we, can we, as I'm, I'm sorry, uh, I see a hand raised here, but I think we have, we have only time for one more speaker. Uh, this is Professor Kamau. Um, Gamal, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Would you can please? You yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Yes, my name is uh, Kamau Gamal. Uh, currently serving as a vice chancellor of the Cooperative University of Kenya which is a public university or state university in Kenya. And I'm glad to have attended uh, this uh, session today. I missed yesterday's session, uh, but I'm glad um, about the discussions that have gone uh, on this uh, whole day. Um, yeah, and uh, really, especially understanding this uh, third educational revolution and knowing where universities came from, uh, really intrigued about the key role that uh, Martin Luther played in getting um, the university system into place and yeah, authority, uh, the universities uh, getting their authorities, again, authority uh, initially from the Pope, but now through the intellectuals in the universities. And uh, how this got lost again uh, to the state. And um, yeah, when I observe, especially in our country, but I believe this uh, applies across um, the globe, uh, the kind of challenges uh, which, um, especially in the public sector that are there, uh, things like corruption, uh, Gillian Kasiria of Uganda spoke about it earlier in the morning uh, when she was talking about the need for curriculum reform uh, we see that um, the current educational system does not prepare individuals uh, properly for uh, yeah, the kind of people we need who can transform society, who have the right attitudes, who have the right values, who have um, uh, yeah, a calling uh, to be able to do something. And, uh, yeah, I agree that uh, the church really needs to take back this role. And uh, actually, some not very long ago, recently, um, I was speaking at our church, and uh, that was the kind of um, encouragement that I was giving them, that the church needs to really uh, come in, especially uh, in uh, contributing to the educational sector. And that was... Um, at various level, at various levels, at the national level, when it comes to determining the um, educational policies, Christian scholars need to come in so that they can guide because uh, they have been absent. And uh, of course, many other people come and uh, fill in this gap, including especially in Africa where Islam has really grown and they have really um, taken the lead and uh, been very instrumental in uh, making the policies go their way, but also in uh, uh, coming up with educational institutions all the way from primary school, going into high school, colleges, and universities, which will be um, having or uh, will be able to inculcate uh, the values which can transform uh, the society. 
But also now I have a question. As I said, I am coming from the public uh, education system, uh, state university. And my question is, uh, what role can uh, public universities still play in this uh, third education revolution, knowing very well that uh, they are Christian scholars uh, within the system, and uh, how can they come in and be able to participate in bring, being able to bring back education uh, back to the church? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kamau Nagamau.